Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened to before, welcome back. I'm here today, as usual, with Dr. Rick Hansen. Dad, how are you doing today? I'm great, actually. Thanks for asking. Yeah, today we're going to be answering some questions from our listeners. I've been really looking forward to this one. It's going to be a great mailbag episode. All of the questions today touch on aspects of our relationships with other people. And if you'd like to ask a question to be answered in the mailbag, you can reach out to us through email, contact at beingwellpodcast.com. You can also find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. Always love these episodes. We got some really phenomenal questions today. So first up, I was in a long relationship that was unhealthy and codependent, and we recently broke up. How can I reconnect with my own identity and figure out what I really want? Well, it's haunting to feel the weight of what it's like to be that person Hmm. and also to feel what it's like to be oneself who may feel somewhat out of touch with deep values, aims, longings of the heart, drifting maybe, or maybe stagnant, hitting a plateau in life, which I think is quite common for people, uh, getting some things buttoned up and taken care of, but then you, you have a little bit of a talking heads lyric going through the back of your mind. Is this my house? Is this my wife? Is this my life? <laughs> How did I get here? And you start to look more deeply. There are a lot of, uh, I think, excellent, detailed ways into this question. I'm thinking for the moment here of the values and action inventories that are worth looking into online. I want to explore this question partly as it lands in me, which comes from more of a bottom-up, soulful kind of place, and offer a couple of, or three actually, inquiries that might that might relate to this, okay? First is to uh, really explore being thoroughly in touch with your own body, especially your body as a whole. Uh, there's something about opening out into awareness of the body as a whole, taking it into account and including it, that can really help to ground us in who we are as a person process, as a whole being. There are various means, Pilates, yoga, walking, engaging with animals, uh, doing things that are vigorous, that really call the body as a whole to respond. The second thing is to, to listen and feel down into what comes bubbling up from below. What are your intuitions? Um, what, what is the knowing, if you really listen to it, that matters to you? You can feel it. And, and then the question becomes, how do we respond to it? But at a minimum, can we kind of feel it? Can we get in touch with it? Can we intuit what's, what's really important to you? If there's an opening for what's important to you, uh, usually answers will arise. I think back on my, my one of two therapists I ever had in my life, uh, this Jungian analyst exploring our dreams. And he said to me one time, you know, Rick, if the unconscious uh, knows that someone is listening, it will communicate more. So there's a listening. And then the last place to look, I'll just suggest, and this is not an exhaustive list, is uh, borrowing on Daniel Levinson's work about adult development, is to look back to the dreams for life you had as a child. And in those dreams, what were the values? Maybe you won't be a rock star or an astronaut uh, or secretary general of the UN, uh, two out of three of those were among my ambitions. I'll let you figure out which two. Uh, and, um, but still there's something in them that was important to you then and may well be important to you now that you can kind of dust off. You know, what did that kid really want? What was that kid hoping for? What were those, that kid's wild fantasies that they put away maybe because other people laughed at them? Uh, and what might be some, you know, good wisdom in them for you today? I love that, Dad, and that was actually where I was going to go with this. One way to approach this question is how do you go back before this mm-hmm. relationship in which you invested a lot of your identity? A, a side question, which we don't know from, from the, what the questioner sent in, is whether or not this kind of a relationship is common for them or not. Yeah. Um, that's another question that I would ask. 
I did a video not too long ago called A Framework for Understanding and Meeting Your Wants and Needs. That's on YouTube where I talk about a lot of this stuff. But focusing on the childhood aspect of it, you can also think about just the kind of person you were as a kid. Like, what was it like to be you? Uh, were you a more uh, in the body person? Were you more of a cognitive person? Were you more emotionally open? Were you more emotionally reserved? Were you very relational? Were you very independent? These all can connect to our values. Uh, you might also ask yourself some kinds of questions like, what are those issues that tend to come up over and over in your relationships? And maybe a cousin question to that that you sort of alluded to there, Dad, what do you still long for? Like, what are the things that you still want that you feel like you haven't gotten yet? What are the ways that you want to be different in the future from how you've been in the past? And all of these kinds of very self-reflective questions will absolutely get the, the wheels turning on this process of self-discovery, in term, which should allow you to connect with yourself in different kinds of ways. Um, it also might stir up some dust along the process, because as you're doing this, there might also be a voice in the mind that's saying something along the lines of, well, my relationship was doing a lot of this for me. Yeah. Or, oh, well, what am I if I no longer have this person? Or, oh, this is, I thought it was A, now it's B, now what? That's all really understandable and really normal stuff uh, that can come up through this process. And to the extent to which you can, I would just kind of let those two streams be two different streams and mm -hmm. try to avoid them uh, commingling into one very chaotic stream. Does that make sense, Dad? Oh, of course. Just to finish up, if I could on this, uh, building on what you just said there, it can be helpful to ask yourself this questions like this. What do I love? What do I love? And uh, we're related to it. Again, it may sound kind of fuzzy, but still, uh, how is love moving through me? What does love want to bring into being? And these kind of heartfelt type questions can also bring you home. That's great. And as you're going through this process, you're probably also dealing with some complicating factors, some grief about the relationship, maybe some social fallout from everything that you went through. And it can just also be helpful to, to have a bit of compassion for yourself here and understand that you're probably going through a lot. And so if these self-identity questions, which are both extremely important and deep and meaningful, and are also often in the... Uh, important but not urgent category for us, it, if they get kind of pushed to the sideline a little bit as you're dealing with other practical considerations, that's really normal. And, and I wouldn't stress out about that too much. So let's move on to our second question here. Uh, this question was submitted to us through Instagram, which is also a great place to get in touch with us. I love the podcasts you've done on liking and wanting, but something I struggle with is how to distinguish between healthy wanting and unhealthy wanting. For example, you're in a relationship, and it just doesn't feel as good as you think it could. On the one hand, maybe this is just craving tricking you into thinking the grass is always greener. On the other hand, maybe you're onto something, and the relationship really does need some work. How can we tell the difference? I thought this was just a phenomenal question. It's helpful for me, just as a framework, to sort out, uh, first of all, wholesome ends, pursued second with wholesome means, while third, being at peace as much as you can with the results. That's what I would mean by healthy wanting. You need a healthy goal. And then if you've got a healthy goal, there's a difference between pursuing that goal on the basis of a kind of open-heartedness and underlying sense of contentment and, you know, some awareness of whether, you know, what you're doing is effective or not versus, as certainly I've experienced a fair amount, pursuing healthy goals in unhealthy ways with a lot of pressure and contraction and drivenness um, at the heart of which is what the Buddha called out a long time ago in the Second Noble Truth, routinely translated as quote-unquote craving. That would be pursuing a healthy goal with unhealthy means. And then ultimately, even if you've got a healthy goal pursued with healthy means, uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, you know, you don't always win the game. Uh, the other person doesn't always want to be in a relationship with you. And what do you do then? Uh, your book doesn't always sell. <laughs> you know, the election doesn't go the way you want. Okay. Um, can you fundamentally find a way to be at peace deep in your core, equanimous, 
you know, with the results. Uh, so that's a framework here. In this particular case, I suspect that asking the question is a bit of a flashing um, light that's saying, blink, blink, pay attention to me. There's some sense that something could be better. And uh, so step one would be to clarify, huh, is that a reasonable thing to want? One way to look at that would be if another person wanted it, how would you judge it? Would you evaluate it as, yeah, that's cool. Or you might think, you know, dude, that's just so unrealistic. It's just not going to happen. Or, you know, there's a lot of trouble in really pursuing that aim here. Um, you know, pay attention. Okay, so now you've identified what it is you, you're looking for. Then I think a first place to start is um, yourself. What can you do to make the grass greener? Where you are, that's on us to do. That's taking care of our side of the street. And then last, talk about it, if you can, with your partner. And I think it's a lot better usually to make requests for the future than complaints about the past. It usually goes better if you do that. Sometimes you have to talk about the past a bit, but framed as a request rather than a demand and um, forward looking, future focused. And then, you know, see what happens. Can you make agreements? Do agreements get capped? Does the other person care about this as much as you care about it? Um, and then, you know, based on that, you kind of discern, hmm, do I want to stick around or uh, do I want to stick around um, and accept what I'm not going to get or do I need to look elsewhere for that in some way? What do you think? I think that this is such a fundamental question. Um, it was treated, as you know, Dad, uh, extremely seriously by the Buddha <laughs> in, in Buddhism and this yeah. question of like, uh, tanha, which is thirst or craving. Um, yeah. And this, I, I think the other one was chanda, if I'm remembering correctly, healthy intention or aspiration, very healthy desire. Yeah. And uh, even in a philosophical approach or religion, depending on how you want to categorize it, like the one that's shared in Buddhism, which has such a focus on avoiding unhealthy wanting. Yeah. There was nonetheless this highlighting of healthy wanting as not just a thing, but an essential aspect of progress. Wise like intention. An essential, yeah, wise intention, an, an essential virtue to cultivate. So this question of like, how do I figure out what's in column A and what's in column B is just like totally fundamental to living a good life, I think. Two different places that people can run into problems. The first place is that you have a totally normal want that you have been conditioned to think is excessive or inappropriate. A lot of people go through life thinking that their totally normal needs for uh, affection, attention, uh, some amount of desire and interest from their partner, uh, clear communication, they go through life thinking that these needs are irrational or excessive because they've been taught that over and over again by the environment. So that's one place where we can make a little bit of a mistake. I also think that, and I'm going to approach this in a slightly gendered way, but, you know, hold on to your hats, particularly for guys who are in a particular developmental stage. This is often mid to late 20s-ish. I do think there is a kind of habitual grass is always greener that can come in. Mm. This kind of desire from to- many experience. A little bit of experience there. Um, this kind of like <laughs> desire to roam the earth and see all of the potential and, you know, go from there. Yeah. And I do think that it's appropriate to be to be aware of that. Uh, I have a wonderful relationship with a phenomenal partner, and I have made concessions to be in it. Yeah. And she would say the same thing. She's yeah. made concessions to be in a relationship with me. You give things up. There is always a giving up of things that happens when you're in a relationship. Um, and I think the balance between those two things that like seeing of the authentic needs and being able to filter out the authentic needs while also appreciating that we do have a tendency to let the perfect be the enemy of the good is you know a really a, a really tricky dance and i think that often it's kind of hard to tell what's in column a versus what's in column b but um i also think dad that what you were saying at the beginning there about wholesome aims pursued wholesomely is a really great line to default to if you're starting to ask yourself these questions the other thing I would ask is, are you open to compromise? Being open to compromise 
will get you so far through the unhealthy or more problematic wants that we have. Most of those wants are about contraction, not expansion. They're about kind of turning in on ourselves in a kind of way, um, or this real feeling of tightness in us mm -hmm. as we ask for something. And if you cannot find that in yourself as you are pursuing these needs, wow, that's a big indicator that they are wholesome, healthy needs. Great. Is there anything else you want to want to add here, Dad, about being able to differentiate between these two things? Because I think that that is something that a lot of people really struggle with. I want to take a crack at it a little bit as a longtime couples counselor. Yeah, and for sure. longtime husband. <laughs> A question to ask yourself is, in a relationship, of course, it has to do a little bit with your anticipated time frame. And I think at certain ages in life, in, a, in our mind, we're in a relationship, but the clock, there's a clock on it. And we just know that this one is not the keeper, this is not the one, and it's okay so far. But, you know, in a time scale of it could be, frankly, weeks, if, you know, months, maybe a little longer, that we're probably going to move on. Okay, so whatever your time frame is, or maybe it's, on the other hand, indefinite, like this feels pretty good, and um, if it was just a little better, you know, I could be thinking about, you know, this being a long-term commitment here. So in that time frame then, then you ask yourself, huh, what would it be like for me to not get this thing that I want, that I care about? A person might go, you know, I sort of like it, but I could live without it, you know, and, and I'm also okay, as the Gottmans have kind of pointed out, there's certain issues in long-term good relationships, they just sort of, they're low-grade brush fires in the background, they're, they fester, they're not enough to end the relationship, and people kind of manage them, they work around them, they bicker about them, but, you know, they, they hang in there with, them, with each other. Maybe it's in that category. Or maybe deep down inside yourself, if you really honor your own innermost being, you would just say, you know, this one's a deal breaker. This one's really important. And because it's really important, I'm going to go to the mat for it. And I would have to say, I, th I think a lot of us, me included, tend to make mistakes on either side of um, the middle way that's really good. On the one hand, we can make mistakes of getting too picky and pissy about fairly small things that we get all caught up in, all right? I literally dealt with a couple one time that got into an incredibly serious argument about how to put the lid on the Tupperware container and whether you do this thing called burping where you push down the lid initially to make the air out, push out, and then you seal the lid. And they literally got into an incredible argument about that, that, you know, put them in my office. Um, on the one, on the other hand, I've known a lot of people Thoreau's version, leading lives of quiet desperation. They're in a relationship. They're kind of stuck in it in a lot of ways. And, you know, it really is far short of what they'd really like to have in their life. And they never really pushed for it, what they wanted to have in that relationship in a sustained kind of way. So either kind of mistake is a problem. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great, Dad. And it's it's always so hard to say with greater specificity without knowing like the specific yeah, circumstance of right. this person. But I think that's a great roadmap for how to think about this kind of an issue. So, all right, moving on to our third question here. How can we stay friends with someone we've had romantic feelings for? I had feelings for a friend and told her about them. And she said she might like me back, but we never crossed the line into obvious romantic or sexual territory. After some weeks, we decided we should just stay friends. Now I feel a bit ashamed and insecure around her, and I'm having trouble relaxing and seeing her as a normal friend. She's part of my general friend group, and it doesn't feel right to completely cut contact. We haven't talked about what happened. What do you think? Do you want to start with this one? Uh, sure. I, I probably think it's closer an to one. it in I'm, terms of I, age. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that, that's a fair point. Yeah. I've definitely been in situations like this. Mm. I think that this is a bit of a time heals all wounds situation. Yeah. I also think there are some things you can do if you want to, to um, smooth things out or make them heal more rapidly. Uh, my, my personal recommendation in most situations is that 
you want to give space for a while before re-engaging content with the person. So if you just recently had an interaction where you guys agreed, hey, we just want to be friends, we want to be cool in a social environment, we don't want to make it weird and just kind of return to that friendship, I would do everything within your power to not make it weird, to return to the friendship, to just be cool for a couple months at least. Mm. before you re-engage any content around it with this person. Um, that will make them feel like you've kept your agreement, like you've been solid on your side of it, like you've been able to sit in a space, manage your own emotions, and continue to make the group dynamic as, as good as it can possibly be. In other words, you're not being a problem. And then on the basis of that, if you get to that point and you still feel like, hey, I've got some some content going on in here that I do not feel like I can resolve without having a conversation with this person about it. You can make a bid for connection from there. Make it appropriately, and if they then give consent, they give you permission to have that kind of an interaction with them, I think there can totally be the space for it. But most of this question, I, th I think, is just about managing those feelings of personal insecurity. And dad, maybe that's where you can come in here about dealing with feelings of like feeling ashamed or feeling insecure in a group, like social anxiety, fears about how you're perceived by other people, managing your own feelings of rejection. That's kind of more your, your zip code. Uh -huh. yeah. High traffic and human suffering. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Thanks. God, we should, we should put that on a mug. Put that out a mug, and maybe that's our next our, our next viral Instagram po quote. I, I, I traffic in human suffering from Rick Hansen. A, a lot of therapists would probably have that mug on their on their desk. I know, and and, <laughs> and with deep compassion and respect yeah, and understanding. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, several things in here. What the phrase that really popped out here for me was the one you flagged here. Why does he, this person, um, I can't tell if uh, this person is male or not and how we identify with that. So we don't know, right? Um, this person feels ashamed and insecure. Those are strong words. And so I'm kind of wondering about that. So I want to unpack a couple of things. How did they get to the just friends place? Because that matters. Did they get to the just friends place because this person had agency? And the bottom line is, as they got to kind of feel into the possibility of romance, maybe they had a little minimal physical contact. Uh, did this person just kind of get to, you know, she, I'm me. just not that yeah. into her. You know, she's just not my cup of tea or there's a red flag here. And so eh, did this person have agency? Or on the other hand, did they like that woman more than she liked them? Yeah. Right. And then... And that's my hunch. That's my hunch. If we're talking it's, about ashamed and insecure, that yeah, it could be also like a 70 30 situation where yeah. they could kind of go either way, but she was really, you know, yeah. Yeah, a little tepid and just, yeah. And you just get that feeling. And the thing about relationships that is sort of a taboo thing to name is that in most relationships, especially in the beginning stages, there's an asymmetry of desire. One person often likes want the other person more than they liked. Yeah, and then, but that asymmetry N not is just normal, like ninety percent of cases, if not, yeah, for okay. sure, like okay. over That's overwhelmingly right. normal. Yeah, and then what do you do with the asymmetry? And a lot of times, people uh, uh, disappear it as a fact because it's they don't want to talk about it. They act like it's not true, but it really is an asymmetry. And if you could just talk about it, um, it then becomes not so much a problem. In other words, does it have to be a problem for me if you like me more than I like you? As long as you're not a jerk about it, it's not inherently a problem. And I'm open to discovering that I may eventually like you more than I currently like you. It doesn't have to be a problem. Flip it around the other way. If I like you more uh, or you like me more than I like you, do I have to run screaming for the hills? Or can I tolerate uh, this asymmetry and not feel guilty about it as long as you are being okay and not creepy and not stalking me and not getting weird and, you know, sticky and eh, like that. If you can just tolerate the asymmetry, more often than not, actually, it kind of equalizes over time. But don't let the asymmetry blow things up unnecessarily early on. 
All right. So let's suppose there's an asymmetry here. Well, how do you cope with that? You, you liked her more than she liked you, and you got to live with it. Did you speak from your heart? Did you make the best play you could? Did you go for it so that, you know, in sports terms, you left it all on the field without being a jerk about it, but you really stuck your neck out, right? You, you went for it. And so you can feel that good about courage. yourself. Yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah. I had a situation like that where I fully went for it and <laughs> she wasn't interested, but bottom line, I was glad I went for it. What's the old line? If you if you make every shot you take, you're not taking enough shots or something like that. Right. You know, it's yeah, there's right. there's a real and look, you want to be, of course, appropriate and thoughtful about these things. Yeah. But generally speaking, like there's a lot of courage in putting yourself out there in that exactly. kind of way. Exactly. So maybe there's a way to kind of turn this to what have you learned from this experience yeah. or you had an experience like this and, and you feel awkward and uncomfortable right now, but it didn't destroy you. Uh, a lot of people are terrified of putting themselves forward in this kind of a way. And their fear holds them back from ever putting themselves forward in this kind of a way. That's right. So the fact that you have been able to do this at all puts you in kind of a unique category. And I think it's appropriate to give yourself some credit for that here. And that can also help you manage those feelings, uh, particularly related to shame, which I thought it was interesting that yeah. ashamed and insecure, these are shame-based feelings, right? Yeah. Negative evaluation of the self. When I think of anything, just like putting yourself out there should lead to so much positive evaluation about the self. And I would, I would kind of build that up or encourage that aspect. Yeah, that's right. Exactly, exactly right. And so just kind of going further then in the friend group environment, it's so easy to have what in shrink world we call morbid self-preoccupations. <laughs> you know, and, I, and in Great Rick line. world, I know what that feels like as well. And Oh, it puts you into a death spiral. You know, you're self-conscious and then you get self-conscious about being self-conscious and, and then you do something self-consciously and then you really start spinning away. Um, and as much as a person can, a way to be is, I think, is track your own virtues. What did you do that was honorable? And what can you keep doing that was honorable? You know, if you made any messes, I think it's okay to clean them up if that's appropriate to do. So you feel good about yourself, doo -doo, and then as much as you can, where's your attention? Is it self-referential again and again and again, or can you kind of release that and be there for the sake of others? Can you like let go of yourself and kind of come forward into the space of the group so that you're there in a blessing kind of way? You're there to see the best in others. You're coming from unconditional positive regard. You're there to be interested rather than try to be interesting. You don't have any hidden agendas. You're all there. That's going to make you feel a lot better. And as a long-term play, it's going to increase your odds of being eventually attractive. I think that's great, Dad. Great advice. And, uh, you know, another one of those questions that we could definitely spend a lot of time with, maybe even do a full episode on dealing with some of these issues that come out of yeah. common situations and relationships, whether that's feeling rejected or denied or some kind of a complicated social situation that emerges out of something, really common stuff. I want to say one more thing here, and I'm going to use terminology that's, that's a little fraught about the nice pony and the naughty pony or the neurotic pony. So you have a cart, right, you have where, a trail. Where are we going here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so let's say here you are and you want to stay, you, want, you have a friendship with this person. Okay. So the nice pony is grounded in being friends. What is it like to be friends? And that's fine. Okay. You're friends and you do friend things. And alongside the nice pony is the neurotic pony that's kind of insecure and a little clingy and, you know, is secretly pulling for reassurance or, you know, a positive regard. And what do you do? What do you do when both of those channels, now I'm shifting metaphors to like channels, are alive in you? And I think a lot of life is about going down the trail uh, that the nice pony is headed down, even if the naughty pony is trotting alongside. Mm, mm -hmm. It doesn't make it a bad trail just because the naughty pony, the neurotic pony is choosing that trail as well. And then you just sort of manage. What's your fundamental source of motivation? Are you motivated in, in your attention to this woman 
or what you're saying or how you are by um, a kind of selfless friendliness that's not seductive, that's not pulling for something, that's not part of some strategy, great. If alongside that, there's a track in your mind that's, that feels, wow, is she a, a, you know, attractive to me? Oh, wow, I'd really hope we could do more. But you know, you just keep disengaging from that motivational track. It may be operating, but you keep turning the channel. Now back to the channel metaphor, to the stream of motivation you want to be living from with that other person. And I think that's broadly true in many, many kinds of settings. We can be really centered in um, virtuous motivations of various kinds. Well, alongside them, you know, <laughs> the mind is a cave of bats. <laughs> All these bats are flying alongside it. You know, the white owl of wisdom is mm. going, is heading north. And meanwhile, all these other bats are flying around also north. But just, you know, because of the bats there, you can stay focused on the white owl of wisdom <laughs> heading north. For the record, I'm a big fan of bats. There's some very <laughs> cute bad videos on on TikTok and Instagram if you're oh, into that cool. kind of pro bat content. But yeah. uh, jokes aside, Dad, no, totally agree with what you're saying here. Okay, it, it's it's normal for us to have complicated motivations and for yeah. our interior to be, uh, you know, a cave of something certainly, and uh, maybe filled with bat guano of various kinds. Yeah, and you know, we have That's mostly right. positive motivations. Maybe there are a couple of other ones that are churning along in the back somewhere, but you just kind of. Move them away and keep going if you can. Yeah, totally, totally. So, okay, our fourth question here, which I think is a really common experience for people. I was criticized a lot throughout childhood, and it's easy for me to feel overly self-conscious or judged when I'm interacting with other people. How can I learn to let my thoughts and speech just flow more naturally? That is 90% a summary of my own primary psychological issues. Uh, coming into uh, adulthood, and in, a, in addition to not just overt criticism, but just feeling implicitly less than others or unwanted or unseen. Okay, what to do? Uh, I think about it both in terms of strategy and tactics. What I mean by that is, uh, and as a broad principle, when you're trying to help yourself heal, uh, you're paying attention to what you're doing off the playing field to develop skills and capabilities and release things and so forth in general. And then what do you do when the bell rings? Kaboom. And let's say in this case, you're interacting with other people and now it's your turn to say something, right? So both are really true. In terms of uh, this, the most important thing is the first one. Train off the field. That's where you can help yourself. That's where you're gonna most develop the factors inside yourself that are going to enable you to do well when the bell rings and the other person turns to you and says, so what do you think about this? Okay, very important. Off the field, I've written a lot about this. Um, I think the opportunity to take in uh, what was missing when you were younger is really, really, really healing. The deliberate internalization of reparative experiences and psychological nutrients that you didn't have when you we were young or they were a thin soup. So you look for experiences where people approve of you, they praise you, they include you, they want you, they acknowledge you. Uh, experiences where maybe you slip a little, you said something a little off and people blink for a second and then they keep going because they're cool, you're fine, you're included. You didn't commit social suicide, you're okay. You know, repeatedly internalizing that. Uh, we wrote about that a lot in the book Resilient about including the chapter on confidence uh, the inner strength that promotes resilient well-being of self-worth. How do you reacquire self-worth if you feel insecure and inadequate? Um, lots to do there, okay? And then in the moment, uh, I think it's really helpful to just keep noticing that most of the time other people are really fine with you. They're all right with you. You're okay. You're doing okay. A second thing is to uh, slow it down, not feel so pressured to come up with something really witty or great or something. To be a good listener, uh, I really learned that one of the best things I could do uh, as someone who felt who was extremely awkward socially was to uh, be, a, be was to listen because it gave other people 
much of what they really wanted, which was someone to actually listen to them and hear them out. And it didn't put so much pressure on me. I was just a good listener, future therapist, of course. And um, so that's a good thing you can do for yourself. And then the last thing is to kind of rest in what's your basic attitude toward other people? Are you there um, with positive regard for them? Are you loving? Are you kind? Are you interested in them? Uh, as I think Maya Angelou put it, people will forget what you said. They will not forget how you made them feel. And there too, a lot lower pressure. You know, just to be kind of a kind, present, supportive, decent, uh, understanding, reasonable kind of person. Uh, people are going to like you a lot. And then over time, <laughs> Um, you'll build up social capital, and then you can step into, uh, you know, ways of speaking and acting that maybe are harder for you in the beginning, but you'll have built up this background of approval for you that'll give you more room to breathe when it's finally time to, to talk more. Yeah, ton there, Dad. Um, and I, I love everything that you ran through, which, as you mentioned, is from a lot of personal experience in addition to, to clinical experience. I think there are different ways in here. You've highlighted a lot of them already. Uh, anything that, any kind of a practice related to self-criticism often relates also to the building up of more of what you call an inner nurturer. Uh, you've talked about that a lot yeah. inside of your work. So things that we can do to build up the more nurturant voice can be a great thing to do. Another possibility here are forms of what's sometimes referred to as graduated exposure. So this could be taking a little step yeah. further than you normally would with exposing yourself, yeah. talking about something that you feel a little nervous about talking about, um, taking a taking a swing in a group environment, whatever that means for you, and then seeing what happens emotionally and seeing if you can stop yourself from going into some of the habitual self-critical or self-conscious patterns that you would normally go into based on that behavior. Uh, this is often best done in very supportive environments. Uh, a lot of people try to do this by absolutely cannonballing off of the diving board in the worst possible environment, and they receive negative feedback, and they go, oh, you know, so I'm never going to do it again because I received negative feedback. It's like, well, you, you kind of were your own worst enemy there a little bit. So make sure that you're being wise about environment selection, including the people you're surrounding yourself yeah. with while you are making these bids. Um, but that, I think, would be maybe the only thing that I didn't really hear you talk about mm -hmm. that would be on my my personal checklist of what this person could move through. Yeah, yeah, you're queuing me up also to add a, a related thing I didn't talk about, which was in terms of training off the field, uh, managing anxiety in general. Mm -hmm. Really useful. A lot of stuff about that uh, cognitively and especially physiologically to gradually help your body rest in a greater sense of calm strength and be able to recover from challenges and return home to that increasingly internalized hardwired base of calm strength in you. And actually our next question is sort of related. So let's do this one. I, I tried to I tried to flow these together yeah, in a way. Yeah. So okay, question number five. Can you give some advice on how to communicate with others during emotional flashbacks, the freeze response, or when recoiling after receiving a bid for affection? Then the person goes on to say, I am receiving therapy to heal from disorganized attachment. And I've realized that when people show affection, say nice things to me, or even just invite me to something, I sometimes freeze and recoil from their invitation for closeness. This is my trauma response, because in the past, being authentic, vulnerable, or connected to others was how I was hurt. It feels scary to be open about this with people but I want to learn how to communicate with them so I can minimize any ruptures. I feel clueless about how to do this. Really sweet question. Yeah, very sweet. I have to say, knowing some people in my own life who, for whom this is fairly true, um, I'm really wishing that they had the level of insight that this person has just yeah. into the dynamic because that level of insight itself is really noble and hard won. Very powerful, you know, yeah. And good for you and good for your therapist, you know, <laughs> and, and your friends and whoever else. Okay, There's a lot here. Uh, one thing I want to say relates to this particular topic, which might seem pretty narrow for 
some people, but really it has broader implications. And here I'm going to draw on the work of Steve Porges and others who really highlight uh, the um, impact of the autonomic nervous system when we get triggered. And the deeply ancient, reaching back literally hundreds of millions of years of the hardwiring of that system in terms of evolution. So it's very primal, very primary. And what happens when we get activated into what, you know, Steve would call, and he's been on our podcast, a dorsal vagal nerve complex, dorsal being the rear or, yeah, the rear of it, you know, and, and more uh, ancient, you know, that kind of puts us into a freeze. Whether it's, you know, you want to think in terms of polyvagal theory or kind of broaden it out, point is when we're flooded, when we're triggered, unless you've done a lot of training off the field, like I've talked about, it's really hard to uh, say something useful. So, of course, it's hard to communicate in the moment. And one of the very first things to do, if you possibly can, is to restore regulation in your body. So you're shifting out of that freeze response and more into a, a, a sense of calm strength, at least in your core, around which, you know, your heart's still beating, your skin is still crawling, you're still anxious, but you're much more functional. You know, restore basic functionality, find your footing. Uh, I've written a fair amount about this. People can look up a little chapter I wrote uh, called Find Your Footing. Um, that's really the first thing to do. And it kind of goes back to my own experience in rock climbing, that you really need to find your footing and move from one then secure hold, secure base uh, out into the world. Um, so that would be part one. I think I would just really stress here. Uh, so when you come into a interaction, uh, you can also anticipate that you're going to get triggered. And so before going into it, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Uh, in other words, you can help yourself establish a lot of resting state, calm, and a lot of sense of being soothed and supported by your allies. I call it the caring committee or the inner nurturer, as you said a moment ago. So you're, you're wanting to mobilize, you're, you're priming your capabilities. Uh, a lot of us uh, just basically underprepare for the battlefield. You know, you know you're going to talk to your boss. You know you're going to meet your partner's parents for the first time. You know you're going on that date, right? Uh, resource up, you know, in, a, at a, in proportion to the level of the challenge. Yeah. The line that's coming to me here, Dad, is hope is not a strategy. Yeah. And I think a lot good. of people enter interactions like this with the hope that they yeah. just won't fill in the blank. They just yeah. won't be triggered. They just won't be activated. It just won't be that bad of an interaction. And that's a that's a very understandable anxiety coping mechanism. Like living in the world of hope can really help us forestall some anxiety about the kinds of interactions we're going to have. But a much more practical solution is embracing the reality that we have a set of tendencies. And we can probably do things ahead of time to just, you know, fill ourselves up a little bit or to prepare ourselves, as you were saying, for these kinds of difficult interactions. Yeah, exactly right. And so that's the little things like anticipating interactions and imagining how you will, um, you know, what you could say or what you could do in them, even if you're feeling kind of upset. Uh, this goes all the way back to methods from neuro-linguistic programming called future pacing. Uh, other people use these kind of methods, including in sports, where you're visually rehearsing you know, going down the mountain in an Olympic skiing event and, you know, so that actually when it comes time, you perform better. You know, you've thought it through, you've anticipated it. Um, I would do things before upsetting conversations, like on, on a telephone or even in person, where I would uh, write out what I wanted to say. I would have key words, key phrases, key points that I wanted to, you know, drip into the interaction that would undoubtedly escape me. <laughs> I had to come up with them on the spot. That can you can really help yourself in this way. Mm -hmm. You really, really can. Uh, okay, and then just to finish, to go to the person's point here at the very end, um, I need to know how to communicate with people, uh, and I feel clueless how to do that. So let's suppose that this other person has said some nice things to me, or they've invited you to something, or they've shown affection as this person says, and you then freeze and recoil or maybe initiate some major distancing maneuver like intellectualizing, making a dumb joke, 
seeming oblivious uh, or even being contentious and, you know, bickering with them about something or other. Let's suppose you did that. And they're looking at you like, what's wrong with you? Or what? I don't get it, right? What do you do then? Um, to the extent you possibly can, and this person seems really well, real, really well equipped to do this, cop to your stuff. That's me from my 60s and 70s. Um, we usually use a different word than stuff. But anyway, cop to your stuff and just kind of acknowledge it. It just normalizes it. Uh, classic line, name it to tame it. You just, you just admit it. It's normal. It's okay. Uh, you can explain things. You know, I grew up in this home where when people were nice to me, it was like a Trojan horse. They got me to lower my guard and then they ripped me off or worse. And so I get a little triggered when people are actually nice to me. So I just kind of want to explain it. I'm understanding it. I'm working on it. It's not you. It's me. And being able to talk about it, you know, is good for its own sake. And it's going to help me be less triggerable the next time around. When you're copping to your stuff, ask yourself, who am I communicating for? There's a very different feeling when you're communicate between communicating to affect another person, like make them understand or get them to see you differently or get them to act differently in the future. There's some place for that, but that feels a certain way. That feels very different from I'm here communicating for myself. I'm going on record here for me. I'm sharing my experience. 80, 90% of my attention as I speak is about my own experience. I'm in myself as I speak. I have a little attention to you and how you're responding to what I'm saying, but I'm, I'm really here in me and for me. You're really just being deeply revealed with a lot of dignity. It's a kind of heroic dignity because it's scary as heck. Dad, do you want to take three to five minutes here to talk about any of the content of the person's issue, this issue around um, I was essentially punished for closeness when I was yeah. younger or closeness was a way in to harm me, extremely common for people. And so now as an adult, I recoil from closeness when it appears and, and bids for connection are actually a threat signal for me. Yes. Um, I don't know if it's possible to do that. This is a deep, deep, deep issue. A person could spend a lot of time, I mean, essentially their whole life working yeah. on. But if you have any ideas or thoughts here just off the top, yeah. um, that could be helpful. A um, lot here, uh, one chunk of body, one body of knowledge about this relates to avoidant insecure attachment. And by the way, disorganized attachment uh, has sort of two meanings. One way of understanding it is the kind of original sense that this was someone typically who'd had an extremely chaotic and often abusive childhood and maybe combined with a particularly vulnerable temperament or it all happened when they were very young, like a, with a premature baby uh, whose nervous system hadn't really come online yet, uh, born a couple of months early, let's say, and they just literally were disorganized. They were all over the place did not fit any kind of neat, insecure attachment category. That common way these days, it's sometimes spoken of, is that basically a person is saying, well, I'm kind of a mix of avoidant and anxious attachment styles. Mm -hmm. So there are these discrete tendencies in me that um, kind of, you know, are both in, the, are both in play. Maybe uh, anxious attachment more in my romantic relationships, avoidant distancing attachment more in my work relationships, but there are these distinct styles. And the reason I'm making this point here is just kind of for the record uh, and with regard to seeing that this person is talking a lot about avoidant attachment uh, that it can also have, and there's a second body of knowledge to take a look at this, particularly the work of James Masterson and how to work with the schizoidal personality style. There's a distancing tendency and a real um, vulnerability and, a, and uh, to feeling flooded by uh, interpersonal contact and some other details. So there's a chunk of good stuff there. 
The question a lot is about tolerance, distress tolerance, becoming increasingly able to tolerate the anxiety that's arising upon closeness or to tolerate the sense of that person is inside your mind, mucking around. They made it through the gates. They're in the inner keep. They're going to get the jewels. Ah. You know, how can you, can you allow the sense of, yeah, they are knowing you. You are becoming known. You are becoming exposed, tolerance of exposure, you know, which was very deadly when you were younger. So you're learning how to gradually tolerate that. It helps to become uh, less anxious in general and more able to manage anxiety generically and then also anxiety specifically about the kind of exposure that and, or, and other feelings that trigger the distancing maneuvering. So you, you do that. And then a lot of it that really helps is to keep reassuring yourself. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And one of the paradoxically good ways to do that is to remind yourself that you can always bunker up. Shields up, Scotty. You're really good at defending yourself. You're really good at disappearing in your relationships. Back in that hole, like a, you know, like a gopher or a turtle, you know, pulling his head back uh, into the shell. Uh, you're just good at that, so you can afford to leave your head out of the shell. As long as, you know, the ax is not coming your way, and as long as it's not coming your way, you can keep your head out because you can always pull it back in a quarter of a second. Uh, that can help you stay more open as well. Okay, I'll leave it there for the moment. I think that's great, Dad. I, I'm, I'm not a clinician, so the specifics of working with these kinds of topics is definitely outside of my zip code. Speaking from personal experience only yeah. uh, and I've you know had my own had my own exploration of these topics in some ways I have two thoughts uh, the first thought is that this is a huge linking place so linking is Very where the practices good. that that you teach it's really central to your work and the basic idea is that you're holding a positive experience that you're having right now alongside a more difficult experience that you had in the yeah. past you are doing everything you possibly can and doing this in a very thoughtful way to make the current positive experience much bigger, much more powerful than the old negative experience. You are not holding up a small positive experience right now next to your deepest, deepest, darkest trauma. You're being thoughtful about this. But it's basically this idea that you can uh, manually engage in a little bit of a self-reflective process where you go, oh, you know, that wasn't so bad. Or, oh, I made it through that one. Or, oh, there is something here that's actually enjoyable. And I can do what I can to just stay with the present moment enjoyment of this experience, as opposed to let it getting wrapped up in all of this psychological content that I have, understandably, about what this experience means or what it's going to expose me to in the future. What's the alarm bell that's going on inside as this experience is activated inside of me? Can I just stay with the experience itself? That's a high bar. It's not always easy to do that. It's very easy to get sucked into the mind stream, but that's something that we can practice with a little bit. The second thing that I was thinking of is more of a kind of warm and fuzzy appreciation for the the willingness to be connected to people at all part mm. of this. After mm. you've gone through these experiences where you have been exploited by other people uh, based on your warm heart. Yeah. You know, these are injuries of connection. And the the irony is that it's only connection that allows us to repair them. But at the same time, just a willingness to open yourself up to that at all, I think, implies a lot of courage and a lot of um, you know, good character, for lack of a better way of putting it, on on the part of a person. And I think there's a place for really uh really like getting that on a on a visceral and emotional level. Um, and giving yourself credit for that and, and for being That's willing beautiful. to do this kind of work. So, yeah. Really beautiful. Oh, really, thanks, really Dad. good. Yeah. Yeah, it's touching stuff. It really is. It's funny. It reminds me of a book title. I wish I could recall the name of the author uh, from maybe the 80s or 90s. The title provocatively was, What You Think of Me is None of My Business. Mm, mm -hmm. And there's something here about just really appreciating that in a way our job is to be ourselves and to be ourselves being authentic, vulnerable, and connected. Clearly, 
There's a warm heartedness in this person. There's a lovingness in this person. Our job is to be our own loving uh, selves, whatever that is, it, alongside maybe some shyness, some awkwardness, some reactive patterns. Very understandably, we're des brains designed to learn from experiences. We learned what worked when we were younger. It's still true. Okay, fine. Uh, that's our job. Our job is to be uh, our our own good person and kind of let the chips fall where they may. And other people will respond as they do. Uh, many other people are caught up in their own inner dramas. Uh, I'm thinking recently of the, um, gosh, Mason Williams, that's not this first name, line, Lucinda Williams' father will come to me. You know, we do not know what wars are going down there where the spirit meets the bone in other people. You know, so whatever wars are going down in there and other people where their spirits meet their bones, don't know. But over here, we can know. You could trust yourself. Oh, wow. You know, you, this person asking the question, you have a good heart. Trust it. You're living from your good heart. You know, head up. I really enjoyed doing today's mailbag episode with Rick. We got fantastic questions from our listeners, as we always do. If you would like to send in a question to be answered on the podcast, you can reach us at contact at beingwellpodcast.com. You can also join us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. You can also just write a comment down below if you're watching on YouTube with a question you'd like to have answered. You can uh, find us on social media. There are a lot of different ways that you can get in touch. All of today's questions had to do with issues related to our relationships. And the first one came from somebody who had recently exited a relationship that they described as being fairly codependent, and they were trying to reconnect with what they felt like was their authentic self. It's very common for people to feel like they just don't know what they want, because a lot of those wants come out of some sense of an authentic self. And if we can't figure out what that self is, then how can we possibly connect with what we want? In my experience, there's generally a three-stage process for engaging with different kinds of wants and needs. First, we accept the reality that we have wants and needs. Second, we can go through a kind of process of identifying what they are. And then third, we actually prioritize meeting them in our lives, and uh, many people fall down on this third step. So a great way to reconnect with that more authentic self and figure out what some of those wants and needs are is by trying to go back in time before this relationship happened. And almost anybody listening can probably get a lot of mileage out of doing exercises like this, where we try to reconnect with the person we were when we were younger, before the world got in the way. One way to do this is by bringing to mind an image of yourself as a young person. What was it like to be you? What were the tendencies you had? What did you like and dislike? Uh, were you more relational with other people? Did you like to be more on your own? What were the things that you really cared about? And particularly, what are some of the values attached to those things as opposed to getting really fixated on just the thing itself? Because we can't always bring to life the exact form of uh, some dream we had for ourselves when we were a kid but we can still learn a lot about ourselves based on the kinds of things that we were prioritizing or the kinds of things that we cared about. The second question was asking about how we can distinguish between healthy and unhealthy forms of wanting, particularly in our relationships. Are we just going, the grass is always greener, or hey, do we actually have a real need that's going unmet, or is there some kind of real problem in the relationship that uh, needs to be addressed? And this is a really difficult question to answer because it's so individual for starters. And then second, it is an enormous question. This question affects so many different aspects of our lives. For me, what's been really helpful is understanding simultaneously that we can relax around craving while still understanding that life gets better when we meet our deeper needs. So a lot of the unhealthy wants that we have emerge from perfectly healthy, perfectly understandable needs. Uh, and these kinds of more maladaptive wants and behaviors flow out of us because those healthy needs aren't getting met. It is totally normal for a person to want connection and affection and to feel heard inside of a relationship and to feel safe and secure, to feel like even if they're not the absolute top priority all of the time, they're the top priority a lot of the time. And when they're not the top priority, they're the number two priority. All totally healthy, all totally normal. And a lot of people go through life essentially thinking that those totally normal needs 
are actually problematic or too much, or they really shouldn't be asking for that, or they're not allowed to ask for that because they've been conditioned to believe that. And I really liked Rick's phrase of going after wholesome ends through wholesome means. Some of this is pretty intuitive. We can have a feeling inside of ourselves of what's wholesome and what's not. I think that a big hint to it for a lot of people are the more somatic or emotional sensations that come along with whatever it is that they're thinking or they're feeling. I personally experience a lot of contraction, like this feeling of tightness or uh, pokiness or aggression, this sort of one-pointedness that comes in when I'm in more of a craving mindset, when there's just something that I want, regardless of whether or not it's something I actually need or whether or not it's even healthy for me to pursue it at all. And so if you feel like you've sat with something for a little while and it's a high priority for you, you really care about it, you feel spacious around it, you don't feel one-pointed around it, and it's really going to bum you out if you don't get this for the rest of your life, man, that's a, that's a big indication that this is not just a grass is always greener situation. Third question was about staying friends with somebody that we had romantic feelings for when the romantic side of that relationship just doesn't turn out. A lot of different pieces to this. I really emphasized how important it is to normalize the relationship up front so that the person that you're interacting with can rebuild some trust in you essentially as just a friend. Then Rick and I really focused on this idea of feeling ashamed and insecure after being, we assumed, kind of denied by this person. There's a lot that we can do to work with those feelings. We've talked about this on other episodes of the podcast. But what we both really attach to is just the idea that should you be feeling shame about this at all or insecurity about this at all? A lot of people never make a bid in their life. They live in terror of rejection. And so the fact that you have done something at all here, that you've put yourself on the table in this way, wow, that actually like speaks very highly of you. And it's something that you can feel warm about yourself about and something where you can really give yourself a pat on the back related to. And so the fact that you did something here at all, you made a bid, is itself like a very courageous and very virtuous act. And it's appropriate to give yourself some credit for it. The fourth question came from somebody who was criticized a lot in childhood and feels very self-conscious and judged when interacting with other people or speaking in a group. And they were trying to figure out how they could let their thoughts and feelings flow more naturally. Rick talked about a lot here. This is very uh, similar to his own process growing up, and so he had a lot to say about it. And he really highlighted a couple of things. First, taking in the good. Then second, slowing down the internalization of positive resources. So when you have that good experience, really let it stick to you, really let it remind you of this went okay, people didn't, uh, people didn't make fun of me, it, it was all really an all right interaction. Most of us are having many, many interactions in a day that go fine. They're small, they're kind of meaningless, we let them just slip through the mind, but they really actually went well. They were totally normal, there wasn't a problem, nobody punished us, nobody yelled at us, and that's all potential psychological uh, content that we can absorb, we can take that in, we can let ourselves feel good for having a normal good thing happen. And most of the time we just don't get any mileage out of that stuff, and that's really what taking in the good uh, is all about. Then a final idea that Rick had that I really liked was focusing on what we can give inside of a group. Can we be a good listener? Can we approach it with just an open heart, where we're not trying to get anything out of the interaction, we're just kind of there to contribute? Because self-consciousness is inherently extremely egocentric. It's very focused on me, 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 I, I, I. And so the more that we're able to flip the script and make it not so much about us, but just open and spacious and about other people, wow, that can really take a lot of the self-consciousness out of it because we're not so preoccupied with ourselves. Final question, great question. Somebody asked how they can better communicate and deal with emotional flashbacks or the freeze response when they're activated. And the person particularly focused on how bids for positive connection were experienced to them as somewhat triggering in nature. And if you're listening to this and asking yourself, wait, how can a compliment or a bid for connection feel threatening to a person? I just really want to validate this person's experience that uh, these it is very common actually for people to feel this way, for them to feel activated or triggered when they receive this kind of a positive interaction with another person, particularly if they have a lot of painful or traumatic experiences in their past related to people who were close to them, exploiting them in various ways. Love and connection was how the pain got in in the past, so these days it's a trigger back into that content. 
There's a lot here. This is a very big, very deep question. We focused on a couple of aspects of it. First, what can we do to prepare for these kinds of experiences ahead of time? As I said, hope is not a strategy. And a lot of people just kind of hope that this activation won't happen to them. So what can you do when you know that you're entering an environment or an interaction where it's possible that somebody will do this? How can you prepare yourself appropriately for it? And then second, Rick talked about speaking for yourself, where you're clear with other people about what's going on, what happened, and you're speaking in a kind of way that, that lends real gravitas to what you're saying, a real kind of weight and an openness to it, where it feels like you're not trying to get something from other people. You're taking responsibility for what's going on. You're just letting them know what's happening. And then I closed this question by focusing on how just being open to this kind of connection with other people at all, if you are somebody with this personal history, is really very courageous. It's very valiant. It's, um, it's wonderful that you're open to it at all. And it's brave that you're open to it. And you can, again, really give yourself some credit here for going back into these environments, back into these situations, and trying to repair this material, um, which is going to have a ton of benefits for you over the course of your life if you're able to do it. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Again, if you would like to send in a question to be answered on a podcast, you can reach us a whole bunch of different ways, email, uh, through Patreon, on social media. If you made it this far and you somehow have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please subscribe to the podcast. It really helps us out. You could also tell a friend about it. You could also leave a rating and a positive review on places like Spotify or iTunes. That also really helps us out. Until next time, thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.